Welcome back, everybody, to the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Christopher Holmes, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Well, today, I am not going to disappoint you like I never disappoint you. I have an amazing guest. Uh, My guest today is Dr. Joseph Krosky. Dr. Krosky has dedicated his professional career to public service and leadership. His journey began at West Point, where he sharpened his skills as a ranger and infantryman serving in Desert Storm. Thank you for your service, sir. Uh, He currently serves as a professor at Penn West University, where he is a passionate mindful ed- mindfulness educator. Uh, he focuses on the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and directs a program to support students who arrive at Penn West with few financial or academic resources. Uh, he was recently named the inaugural executive director of the Frederick Douglass Institute, where he supports belonging, inclusion, and transformation for the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. That is just a small piece of who this young man is. And so I'm ready to dive into this conversation. So welcome, Dr. Krosky. I'm so glad to have you. So glad to be with you, Dr. Holmes. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Well, listen, before we get into Dr. Krosky, we've got to find out who he was a few years ago. And so talk to us a little bit about young Dr. Krosky. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that question. Young Dr. Krosky was... uh, a dreamer, I suppose. You know, I was fortunate. My family was in the military. My dad was an Air Force NCO. My mother was a teacher, and they both appreciated traveling. So I was born in Washington State and lived in Oregon for a year each, and then we went to Turkey. So I grew up hearing the call to prayer, you know, from age three to five, basically. And then we went from there, a brief stop in Florida, where they were both from. And then we went to Okinawa, which is an island of Japan, wow. and I spent six through nine there. And then they moved from there to Illinois, where I finished the schooling, you know, my high school and everything there in, in central Illinois. And so through those experiences of living in other cultures, countries and places, I really got a love for wanting to be around different kinds of communities, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And uh, then that led, you know, to a lot of things. Um, While I was in Okinawa, I got interested in martial arts. And while I was in Illinois, I got really interested in leadership, student council things in high Mm -hmm. school and and athletic things. And then that led me to West Point. I had never really thought about West Point until I learned that it was free. So if you're a young (laughs) person out there and you want a good education, you can get a free one at the military academies. That worked out for me, you know, it was uh, a really good thing to go through West Point. Um, And one thing that surprised me while I was there, I realized I wasn't as astute of a student as I thought I was, you know, in high school, right? Yeah. I had experience in college. And so I never thought of pursuing a master's degree or doctoral degree after that undergraduate experience. But that undergraduate experience, among other things, uh, led me to learning, like you said, at Ranger School, you know, I, I got to, to learn some things about leadership through some really challenging things that the military throws at you. Desert Storm, and then I came back. And uh, after that, while I was at Desert Storm, actually, I had the idea that I wanted to do something in education, probably because my mother was a teacher, her parents were teachers, and my father, in his way, was an educator. He did workshops once he retired from the Air Force and worked civil service. So, you know, those were the kinds of things that um, led to where I am today, I think. Wow. I, I do want to ask you this. For you guys that don't know, we have a whole conversation before this interview starts. So <laughs> I told him I was going to be asking things that were probably unscripted. But when I think about you traveling around the world as such a young child, uh, different countries, different places, e- even here in the U.S. Um, how did those experiences shape identity for you? Yeah, thank you. The uh, I, I mentioned going or hearing the call to prayer. And so that developed, it must have, I still have a deep interest in religion and spirituality and those kinds of things. My parents, after they left the South, met a couple who was in the Episcopal Church, and we became Episcopalians. And so I grew up as an Episcopalian. And so that's going to tie in. And, and then by being in Asia, I got interested in martial arts. And all those led to me being curious about 
things that are in Asia and other philosophies, mm -hmm. maybe even now I would say meditation. Mm -hmm. and I was just really curious about those things. And um, those really led to me wanting to become a mindfulness teacher. And, and really, <laughs> I was forced into my doctoral program. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to study. And I knew I had an interest in meditation. Mm -hmm. and those formative experiences of being in other cultures, being aware of religion and, and these other practices in the Christian church. I had gone to something called Konania, and so there was a contemplative practice, a contemplative prayer practice, which is a type of meditation from the Christian church. And, you know, today is uh, Fat Tuesday, uh, also known as Shrove Tuesday in our church. And so I'm really happy that uh, we are doing this conversation today. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk to you about so many things. Uh, if you can't tell, this is a deep brother, guys. This is this this brother is deep. And so uh, somebody may go through some own their own level of peace while they're watching this interview today. Uh, so I hope that you are really going to dive in and be open to several of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, so let's talk about after West Point, you serve, you come back uh, and you said that somehow you were forced into your doctorate. So let's talk a little bit about that. How, how does one become forced into a doctorate? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I had that inkling that I wanted to get into higher education and I worked for a software company and then I went into teaching software at an institution and then I realized I had to get a master. So I, I did that and that led to a position and then another position where I got chosen and it was faculty at this university. And they said to accept this position as faculty, you have to pursue a Ph.D. And so I said, OK, <laughs> uh, and uh, I think I was a year late pursuing it. And I don't know what happened, but uh, I started the program. And again, you know, they asked that first question, what will you put your research into? What will you research? And, and I wasn't really sure. But fortunately, I found an article by Hall in 91 that said that research she had done on her students demonstrated that meditation helped her students improve academically. Mm. So I was off to the races from there. I found that Google had a program teaching their employees about mindfulness meditation. And there was an organization of contemplative mind in higher education. And one of the leaders of that organization helped put together Google's training program. Mm. So one thing led to another. And I went to Google's program, search inside yourself. And then I decided I wanted to become certified in that. And um, I thought that I would use that information for my PhD research, but we ended up using another program that came out of Duke called CORU to mm. develop the research for the mindfulness study that I did. Well, I want to dive into both of those, uh, but first let's talk about this. Let's talk about that journey <laughs> on that doctorate. Uh, how was it? Um, where was your support system? Because everybody has to have one. Um, and then let's talk about the feeling once you completed the program. Thank you. You know, the journey <laughs> is a trial, but what I usually try to tell <laughs> people is that, you know, you're going to go through a period of time. For me, it was a number of years, but you're going to go through this five years or three years or whatever the academic portion of your program is going to be. And you can find the time to squeeze in something that can be so much more valuable for you at the end. It seems like you don't have a minute to spare right now, but if you haven't started a doctoral program because you think you don't have the time or the resources, somehow those things appear. Yeah. And I was so blessed and fortunate that I decided about meditation because that was one resource that really helped me be resilient through the program. Our university was going through changes. My job changed three times as I was going through my doctoral coursework. And so there are a lot of challenges going on personally mm. that meditation and mindfulness practice gave me the resilience to be able to deal with, right? And, and so I had faculty at my campus that were encouraging and supportive of my program. Definitely my wife was there. She would drive everywhere. I'd be sitting in the car typing papers out or <laughs> he'd be going to people's houses and I'd pull myself away in a corner and working on a paper. And so my friends were supportive. 
because they worked and my wife works in higher education. So she understood and, uh, and our friends and family understood and, and they supported me through that whole process. And I can't thank them enough for all they've done. Yeah. Sometimes just having that one person to say, man, you can do it. You're right. And you'll find one of your professors that you can count on to say you can do it. You know, I had started a program previously in anthropology and, and that professor said, you can do it. But I didn't quite have all the resources I needed then to complete that program. And I switched programs later on and I went to a leadership program and just remembering her saying that you could do it and having new faculty saying that, you know, you can do it, you work with us, and they'll support us through the process because everybody has struggles going through the process and there are people out there willing to, to help. Yeah, most definitely. Now here you are as a completed certified earned doctorate and years before here you were entering West Point not even thinking you wanted to even go to college, but it was free. <laughs> so you you checked that box off and, and you ended up with a doctorate degree. So talk a little bit about the feeling once you actually earned and got that doctorate in your hand. It was a wonderful feeling. My, my uncle is a professor at University of Miami. Uh, and and so he was one of the first people I called. He also supported me through the process, Dr. Braddock. And I was there with my wife, you know, Kathleen Elwood, and, and she supported me. And my mom had passed away. But just to be able to be a part of this family of educators, you know, it just felt I, I can't even describe it. It was just such a wonderful feeling um, in one sense. It happened, I finished just before the pandemic. So I don't know if I really got to celebrate <laughs> because of <laughs> the lockdown, but uh, in another sense, it was just nice to have it done. It's still surprising yeah. for me sometimes to hear someone say, Dr. Joseph Brosky. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, you talk about imposter syndrome, I'm like, oh, You're that's right. me. <laughs> yes, yeah. so I think I'm still in there, uh, not quite fully living into the role of doctor, but uh, definitely appreciative of the process and the things I've learned along the way. Yeah. Now I want to tap into uh, your work. So talk to us a little bit about mindfulness. What is it? Um, what is the purpose of it? And how can it be helpful to those uh, that engage in that practice? Yeah, I'll go with a definition of mindfulness, sort of pulled from the UK. The UK, they're looking at how mindfulness can help in education, healthcare, workplaces. And so it's this ability to be aware of what's going on inside of you, what's going on around you and with other people, and to have that awareness with basically no judgment, right? You mm -hmm. approach it with an attitude of kindness and curiosity. And so that can be challenging. Uh, someone has just, you know, <laughs> I go back to the military, you know, read you up and down you know? <laughs> and in the military fortunately you know we were given four responses at west point yes sir no sir no excuse sir sir i do not understand so so quickly we learn to kind of manage ourselves right mm -hmm. we might be upset about something someone is saying about us we might be embarrassed but but we learn how to choose our response and so you know through that training at west point i had had some of that, but mindfulness has given me a whole nother aspect of looking at it, you know, in terms of dealing with whether it's a student or a student's family that are struggling with a particular situation, you know, you can be there with them. Mm -hmm. Listen, you can listen to understand. And as you learn and take in all the information you can, because you're really listening and not trying to put your own story in or ask questions that's going to divert them, you're, you're really listening and you get filled with that information from them. And then you can respond in a way that's empathetic and compassionate. And so mindfulness has really given me the ability to do that. And going back to mindfulness for my PhD program, as I started learning how to practice mindfulness, I would go from having three browsers open with 20 windows each <laughs> because a question would pop into my head and I'd be <laughs> curious about that. 
and then 20 minutes later i'd get back to my paper and then another question and i you know so i learned to to focus and and maintain my attention where i wanted it to be and that's one of the key aspects of mindfulness meditation it allows you to learn to direct your attention to what's most important now yeah and so i know that you apply a lot of this to to leadership um, especially in the classroom. So it kind of works in, in various uh, arenas. Um, how do your students respond uh, to this mindfulness uh, when you're, because I can tell you're, you're a very engaging professor. Uh, so what, what is typically their response? Thank you. I, I like to encourage students to start a class with just a, a mindful minute to arrive, so to speak, you know, just encourage them to focus on a sensation like breathing or sounds just to quiet their mind and get into the zone of being in class. And oftentimes students are struggling with whatever's going on at home or whatever test might be coming up or whatever relationship issue. And that one minute to pause, students have found very helpful. You know, they mm. would say, oh, yeah, I'm dealing with this job in the summer and I don't like my boss. And I remember he said, <laughs> you know, to focus on your breathing, right? So, so these little practices that we can share that can help people to deal with the situations as they come up in their life in a more resourceful and a more resilient way. You know, some students appreciate it. I'm sure there are some students that say, well, oh, there's Krosky, you know, <laughs> what's he talking about this stuff again? But luckily now, when I started my dissertation, there was not not that much research on mindfulness compared yeah. to today. And there's still a lot more to be done, but the research is definitely clear that this is a practice that can help people. And we like to say it's like a public health revolution, right? Yeah. 50 years ago, people were not going to go jogging just for fun, right? But today we know that moving is beneficial for our minds and bodies. Yep. They weren't brushing their teeth like they are today. And so I imagine for children 50 years from now, you know, it'll be similar to exercise. You know, I should be practicing a little mindfulness because that can help me to deal with things better. You know, I just I just think about, you know, before I I had vocabulary for the things I used to do in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have my students come in. Of course, when you're in a classroom, high school building, there's all types of things going on. And so they would enter into the room and I would say, OK, I need everybody to put your things down, put your hands on your desk and close your eyes. Right. Because what I need you to do is to be present in this moment. There's a lot of things that you're entering into this room with. I want you to imagine that everything that was happening before you came in, you left at the door and you entered to be present into this particular class and all that stuff. You can pick up when you leave off. Some of that stuff, you need to leave it there. Don't even pick it up. Just leave it. Uh, and so now I want to tell people what I was doing then was practicing mindfulness. I didn't know it, but I'm, I want to start still in that language because I do. I really want them to be fully aware of what I was teaching because that's the whole process of teaching and learning. If you can't receive what I'm telling you because right. you've got so much baggage, and I love what you said earlier, that when you listening, that you feel yourself with what the person is saying so that you can respond properly. I love that idea as words are coming out that I'm consuming them in a sense mm -hmm. so that I'm actively listening to respond to what they said versus probably what's going on inside of me. Right. And Dr. Holmes, I'll commend you. You know, I was going through my process and my uncle's wife, um, she rest in peace as well. She um, said similarly that with her grade school children, she would have them do that. Come in, put your hands on your desk, feel the coolness of the desk, you know, and that's how she would do her students as well. So that is a practice that teachers everywhere should incorporate into their daily routine. Yeah. And when I think about you at the higher ed level, um, or just students in general, there are so many pressures now. When I think just about social media and the way they engage and interact and they receive, uh, as we talked about, maybe seeing themselves, their own identity from around the world, like being mindful is very important. Very much so. Thank you. Yes. Now, in terms of leadership, uh, those same aspects, because Sometimes we don't see great leadership uh, in our life uh, being modeled for us. And so I know that you say that you attack leadership from a different approach, right? You are trying to really tackle this next generation. So um, what do you think your style of leadership or your approach to leadership um, is going to do in terms of shifting and preparing them for the type of generation that's coming up next? 
You know, I would like to say, although I don't know if it comes out as I would really intend it to, is that we have to lead from love, right? It's all about love. Uh, one way to conceptualize that is that the actions you take should come from a spirit of love, <laughs> you know, hoping to generate more peace and love in the world. But we can use mindfulness as a way to be a foundation for developing emotional intelligence so that mm, yeah. with those emotional intelligence skills of understanding yourself, understanding your motivations, understanding others and being able to interact with others so that you can influence them positively means, you know, you you might have to put yourself to the side, like you said to your students, leave it at the door. Yeah. Meet that person where they are and then work with that person as through that mindfulness idea of kindness and curiosity, right? Just be curious about what might arise. And, and so it could be that, you know, people are always surprised that I went to West Point because I'm more laid back than <laughs> some general in their face kind of a person, right? And so right. Uh, I don't know that you necessarily have to be that way in order to influence people. And so I guess, you know, again, I just hope that it comes from people recognizing that I'm recognizing in them a kindred spirit mm -hmm. and we're on this journey together. And we hope to get to that place where we can see happiness, where we can see thriving, where we can see a beautiful world. You know? Yeah. And so that's that's where I hope to lead from. So now you're doing a lot of work at Penn West. So let's talk a little bit. Besides just being a professor, uh, you support a program um, that supports students who are uh, coming in with few financial or academic resources. So number one, thank you for that work. But talk a little bit about what that looks like. So it's a program that people are probably familiar with in terms of it being similar to TRIO Student Support Services. Okay. And so we bring in not only first generation students, but they have to meet uh, income levels. So they have to be twice poverty or less. And in high school, their GPAs had to be a certain level or less in order to be supported by our program. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that some students might have had a 4.0 in high school and they get to college and they might end up not having that in college. But in general, that's the population we go after. After a semester, when we recognize those students aren't really adapting the way we want them to, then we might support those students who had a stronger high school background. And it's a state supported grant by FIA. So FIA gives our institution a certain amount of money to provide these students with mentors, with tutoring, with academic coaches, right? So we have success coaches basically that can help students in all the different aspects that they're gonna come across, whether it's trying to help them deal with that FAFSA and completing all that financial information. We just did a scholarship workshop We've just invited a speaker to come and talk to the students. Uh, the speech is going to be financially fine by 29, right? Stephanie Garner is going to do that for our students. The credit union is going to talk to the students so we can get them some financial literacy. And, you know, and one student, many students have, have struggled with the math that's offered at our university because it's just different from most math classes they've had. And so, you know, sometimes it's we have group study sessions. All right, let's figure out how we're going to get through this math problem. And it's nice because then some students can help other students. We can give some resources to help them go through those challenging classes that we know they're going to have. So that program is designed to, to help the students not only bond with us, their resource supports, but also bond with each other so they can learn to support each other. Yeah, that's beautiful. Building community within a community. Right. So those are the goals of the program. So I know that doing that work then led to you being the inaugural executive director of the Frederick Douglass Institute. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I. I've learned so much more about Frederick Douglass since I was appointed to this position, and that was a remarkable person. Right. Yeah. He had vision. He had courage. He had resilience to beat all resilience. And he dedicated himself to learning that craft of speaking and writing so that he could influence people. A man who was born a slave and then not only <laughs> influenced a nation through his abolitionist work, 
but he influenced President Lincoln, right, in terms yeah. of releasing, you know, helping push President Lincoln towards the Emancipation Proclamation, helping generate those thoughts that every slave everywhere should be free, not just the Southern states. And then, you know, he accomplished that. And then he helped the women to get the vote, right? He was with right. the women to help for their uh, ability to vote. He did so many things. He worked as an ambassador. And uh, yeah, so our Frederick Douglass Institute is designed to support both undergraduate students and to support graduate students. So we have fellowships and we encourage people to apply for these fellowships. If you're about to finish your doctoral program and you want to come teach with a good salary at one of the 14 state institutions, come to Pennsylvania. We're looking for a young, bright, uh, new or about to be newly minted PhDs to come and teach in our Ooh. institutions. And we will support those faculty that come and teach with us in that fellowship by providing some professional development opportunities, as well as a network amongst themselves to support each other as they work towards finishing their doctorate and as they get integrated into this higher education uh, lifestyle, so to speak. Wow. So that's one of the main programs. And the goals are to support you know, the initiatives that we have to transform the state system so that we have more diversity in terms of faculty, staff, and students. We have curriculum diversity. We have better outcomes for all of our students. Those are the goals that we are striving for. And so on the undergraduate level, we sometimes engage those fellowship scholars to help with the undergraduates, at least providing a workshop. You know, hey, I made it through, you can make it through, and this is how my PhD has gone for me to help encourage those young undergraduate scholars. And we have 14 different schools, and so there's probably 14 different ways that we're working with undergraduates. Some schools are really focused on helping those students learn how to develop research. Mm -hmm. Some really engage the students in the Douglas debates that we have. Mm -hmm. We have a conference in the spring for students to uh, present their research. And although our focus tends to be towards supporting uh, primarily uh, underrepresented or marginalized populations, everybody's welcome to be a part of the undergraduate program and the fellowship program. And so there's a spring opportunity for those students to present where they wouldn't normally probably get a chance to present because they might not have the typical mentors in their discipline to go present at other conferences. And we have the Douglas debates, which is really a way for students to practice doing some research, defining their argument, and then delivering it, both positive and negative, about a topic. This year, we're talking about ecological justice. And because that has been such an important topic for people in our community, whether it's in Flint or whether it's in uh, you know, the native lands, it's, all these areas have been impacted because of the lack of justice yeah. in the ecological space. And so we're looking at that this year for the Douglas debates. And uh, this federal government and our local Pennsylvania government are doing things in that area. So it's nice that we're on top of the policy kinds of issues that way. Wow. So many opportunities, so much support. I mean, I just, everything you just said, I love. These are great opportunities for, and, and like you said, undergraduate and graduates, right? For those that are looking to teach, you want to get into a higher ed, look into the fellowship. Uh, that is definitely something that I don't think a lot of opportunities are there for minority students. And so if you can find one, get into it. Right. <laughs> get into it because we know sometimes applying for those positions as adjunct or full-time, they can be very hard to get into. Oftentimes because some of us don't have, um, the, the research background uh, and the publications to compete with some of the other stu uh, students that don't look like us. Uh, and th not because the, they're not there at your institutions, you're just not picked for those opportunities. That's exactly right. And so we're also going through, Oregon State has a search advocacy program. We're going through that and trying to spread that throughout the system so we can improve the opportunities for people to be reached to mm -hmm. those other positions that we might not normally get yeah. Yeah. I always say that for minority students is not that uh, we're often not reached out to because we're reached over. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue. And so we really want to change that. And so I think having a diverse staff at universities just like yourself, you become the voice 
uh, for those that will come after you and hopefully the many that will come after you to continue to do this type of work. Um, and so this will lead me to my next question. See, that was a this was a good segue. So what will be your legacy? You know what? Um, as you said that, you know, we've got to influence people so that everyone has a sense that we all belong, right? Mm. And so part of my legacy, I hope, is that students learn some skills that they can use and take with them. And no matter where they are, they can apply them. That's the mindfulness skills. But I also hope that my legacy is that I've established a way to help bridge the challenges between those people who might overlook us and, and, and bridge to them so that they recognize that it's not something that should be overlooked, but we need to work together uh, more often because we can work and do more together and be better together versus trying to overlook and stick in the same ways that we've been doing things, right? Yeah. We've got to find a way to, to bridge the differences. The challenges that we face today are significant. You know, I do work in my church along these lines of DEI and uh, it's challenging in parts of America where they don't want to hear it, right? But as long as we can be open and curious and find ways to have conversations with people who might believe completely differently, we can make that bridge and we can make it possible for future generations to enjoy that beloved community, you know, that Martin Luther King talked about. So yeah. well, I hope I can be a small part in that one cog, so to speak, in the wheel of change, moving things forward. Yeah. You, I jokingly talked about the imposter syndrome a little bit earlier, but you simply said two words just then that struck a chord with me. And I think they'll, they'll strike a chord with many people. And that is simply, you belong. Mm. There are people in places that are doubting themselves, um, maybe because of what they see, maybe because of what they hear or what they feel. And they don't feel like that where they are, they belong there. Right. And what you're saying is, no, you do. You belong right where you are. You're supposed to be there and you don't move until you get what you came for. Right. You belong. I love that. That just, I don't know, that just struck something in me when you said it. You belong. And so I'm going to say it again to somebody else. Mm. You belong. Uh, you belong. That's right. Wow. We'll make wow. Um, what's coming up next for you doing so much already? I mean, is there anything else in the work that you're doing? Well, you know, I've been really blessed. I told you I went to that program to work with the organization Search Inside Yourself. And uh, I'm working now with the United Nations, sharing mindfulness practice to help their staff in, in all kinds of places um, deal with the challenges that they're facing. You know, the, we just did a workshop this morning for people around the world. I'm going to Serbia pretty soon. And uh, these practices are really beneficial. So the future is trying, like I said before, to spread a little more love, peace and happiness and all the avenues I can. Well, you know, we are so grateful to have you uh, as a member of the Black Doctoral Network. These are the individuals that we have in have guys. If you doubt it, uh, if you're unsure about joining, trust me, we have some phenomenal members in this organization. So talk a little bit about uh, your role with us, your relationship with us, what you're looking to to um, experience as a part of BDN. Thank you. And I wish I had known about you sooner and gotten involved sooner <laughs> for all the resources that are available. You know, and it, this is just one small sample, but to be there at the conference in October in Atlanta was just a beautiful experience for the people I was there with and, and all the people that were enjoying the conference. <laughs> I, it's, it's remarkable, but I, I looked up and I saw someone I hadn't seen since college, so 30 some years, right? <laughs> and she was there representing her university and I was there representing our universities. And to know that these resources like her, like all the others that were there, it's, it's just truly remarkable. You know, to be amongst people who are going to support you, make you feel like you belong. It's really a wonderful space that you all are creating to support us as we move forward. And I can't thank you enough for providing that space for us. 
Well, thank you again uh, for being a member. Thank you for joining me today for uh, this interview. I really enjoyed talking with you. I know everybody who's listening and watching has also enjoyed it. Uh, can you tell our viewers and listeners where they can go to learn more about the, you and the work that you're doing? That's a really good question, Dr. Holmes. <laughs> I, I, LinkedIn might be the easiest place, just my name, Joseph Krosky, C-R-O-S-K-E-Y, and I, I'm not uh, that prevalent on social media or uh, websites, so to speak, but, um, and I work at Penn West University, so there aren't too many Joseph Kroskys out there. <laughs> if, if you type it in in any search engine and you see someone that looks like me, then you, you probably hit the right one. <laughs> Well, thank you again for being here, guys. Go and follow Dr. Krosky, an amazing man, an intellectual man, a man of integrity, a man who leads through love. And that's important. That is his mission. That's his legacy. And so, again, thank you for being here. Now, while you're following Dr. Krosky, don't forget, save a little space for us. Go find a little bit more about the Black Doctor Network. We would love to connect with you as well on all of our social media channels. Thank you guys for joining Dr. Krosky. Again, thank you. Guys, I will be back again with another amazing guest. So make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Until then, like I always say, be safe, but more importantly, be blessed, and I'll see you next time.